to introduce you to a project that we're working on, and I think it's pretty darn cool. Um, I'm Paula Williams, an aviation marketing consultant with ABCI. And of course, whenever you get two or more smart aviation people together in a room, the stories are going to start flying. And when you start mixing cocktails, things start to really get fun. So we wanted to recreate that experience in a podcast. Um, this podcast series is called Contrails and Cocktails, and it's sponsored by Global Aircraft Group. Um, Global Aircraft Group offers desktop appraisals, uh, expert witness and pre-buy inspections. Uh, the founder is located in New England, and he travels free of charge to anyone in New England with a situation that needs his services. Um, so you may need an aircraft appraisal for an aircraft transaction, of course, or for an estate settlement, or for a divorce, or for a legal situation. Whatever it is, if you've got a problem, uh, Mark can help you solve it. So for our very first episode, we have uh, the founder of Global Aircraft Group and a very special guest, and we couldn't have asked for a better combination for our first episode. Um, Jet Values Jeremy is very active in the aviation industry. He currently holds an AMP, IA, and FCC licenses and is a commercial certificate with instrument rated pilot. Um, as a former member of the Society of Licensed Aircraft uh, engineers and technologists. He uh, was elected by the Royal Aeronautical Society as a technician uh, in 1987. Um, he's actively involved in the Greater St. Louis Business Aviation Association. Uh, during his varied career, he's been very active in different roles for the National Business Aviation Association, the Popular Flying Association, the Experimental Aircraft Association and the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. I think every association having to do with flying, uh, Jeremy's been involved with it. Um, he's also been the vice president at Jet Brokers, a professional aircraft sales company. Um, his duties at Jet Brokers included acting as a direct interface between aircraft purchasers and sellers, uh, marketplace research, prospecting, technical status and compliance review, pre-purchase inspection monitoring, reporting, and aircraft appraisal, of course. Um, prior to Jet Brokers, he was a vice president at a St. Louis-based full-service FBO and repair station uh, and aircraft parts manufacturing company. Uh, Jeremy is the author of many books and trade journals and more certifications than we could possibly have time to mention here, uh, no matter how long this podcast ran. Um, Mark Perry, uh, is the president and founder of Global Aircraft Group. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in corporate aviation. He has unparalleled access to professional services, which helps his organization achieve positive returns for his clients, investment, and capital. Um, prior to establishing Global Aircraft Group, Mark worked for Bombardier in numerous capacities involving sales, maintenance, completion, pre-purchase inspections, um, he was also employed by the Lockheed Advanced Development Program, um, also known as, or better known as, the Skunk Works, uh, under Kelly Johnson. Mark holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts in management. He's also a senior uh, certified aircraft appraiser and member of the Professional Aircraft Appraiser Association. He's a licensed airframe and power plant mechanic. He attended the Massachusetts School of Law in Andover. So when Mark asked Jeremy to participate in this project, Jeremy immediately suggested that they talk about the history of Pan Am and the legendary cocktail, the Yankee Clipper. So let's dive in. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Contrails and Cocktails. Uh, and Today, of course, we have uh, Mark Perry of Global Aircraft Group and uh, Jeremy Cox and of Jet Values Jeremy. And uh, the two of you guys, I think, are really, really cool to have in a conversation about contrails and cocktails because you guys both have a wealth of information about aviation history and alcohol. Two of my very favorite subjects. Well, I really appreciate having uh, Jeremy as our guest for this uh, podcast and, uh, and the subject matter for today and also for you two to make sure that people uh, stay to the end to find out the new the, the cocktail for the episode 
and to like and subscribe. And then um, also I thought we would do a little bit of uh, share a few war, aviation war stories if we have some, and then Jeremy uh, can go into his presentation from there. Anyway, one of my war stories uh, that I like to tell people is uh, when I first started in aviation uh, as a uh, uh, just a mechanic with Canada Air in the early 80s, I was sent on an engine change. The uh, 502 Avco engines were, I think Jeremy, Jeremy might remember those uh, problems they had in the early days with the Challengers. Uh, they were making metal all the time. We were changing engines just pretty much around the clock. And uh, so it was one of my first road trips, I was sent down to uh, FedEx to help change the engine on uh, FedEx Corporate Challenger. And um, anyway, when we got done with that, uh, we all went on a test flight to test the engine that we just installed. And uh, I got to meet the, uh, we spent some time hanging out with the pilot. Uh, his name was uh, Milo High, believe it or not. And, what a name. Uh, yeah, Milo High. That's what I remembered all these years. He was uh, one of Elvis Presley's uh, uh, chief pilots on his Convair when he had a Convair, I guess, back in the day. And he had a big gold necklace uh, with a lightning bolt with uh, TCB for taking care of business, which I guess was Elvis's. Uh, logo or what do you like to give out anyway <clears throat> so uh this guy had he was he was near retirement age so uh we he, we we were hanging out waiting and he was telling us uh all the stories and such how uh they would get phone calls in the middle of the night and they'd have to meet at the airport and fly umpteen number of people to Las Vegas or wherever for a party and whatever they came up with and bring them back that kind of thing. So we had a lot of interesting stories. Yeah, how would it be? The Elvis is pilot. That would be something else. Yeah, it was really cool. And, you know, I'm just a young guy, so I was really impressed with all that. But, but, uh, and, uh, but uh, anyway, we get up to 40,000 feet and the, uh, the bleed band, uh, the it's called on the uh, compressor section on that um, on that engine. It's literally a, a titanium belt, just you know, just a flat piece of titanium, and it had it had hung up, and at about thirty forty thousand, we were up over thirty thousand feet. That engine did this massive compressor stall, and uh, so. Uh, you know, being a new mechanic, I thought that was, it was quite unnerving. <laughs> so, but anyway, mm -hmm. the co-pilot came back, looked out the window, make sure the engine was still in place. Uh, the uh, head mechanic said, yeah, compressor stalled, lead band, don't worry about it. And we landed unevent and uneventfully. <laughs> oh man, that's the kind of thing you don't want to have happen. So that's my, one of my many stories I have. <laughs> yeah, well, the overtime uh, paid for my help, help my first house and uh, a lot of diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Jeremy, I know you've got a million stories as well. Well, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to go back in time. And uh, for me, and that was, uh, I, I started out in this business in 1975 as a schoolboy uh, in England at the Dorset Gliding Club. And I spent the summer of 1975 moving the gliders back and forth and riding in the tow plane, which was great fun. And it kind of inspired me to uh, uh, end up in an apprenticeship while I was at high school uh, with a uh, a grass airfield uh, on the uh, the top of the downs. That's the crazy thing about uh, the British. They uh, if if it's a hill, they call it a down. <laughs> if it's a private school, they call it a public school. So so everything's opposite. It's kind of like uh, like the political situation today. Everything is opposite. 
from they, what was really going well. on. Just opposite. <laughs> so anyway, so on top of the, the downs in Dorset, this beautiful uh, uh, airfield, grass airfield, had a flight school and a charter certificate and maintenance organization. And, and I worked uh, as a schoolboy from, uh, oh goodness, from 10 years of age all the way up until I left them. Uh, and uh, I worked school holidays and weekends, uh, did everything from uh, uh, painting the uh, whitewashing, the runway markers, which were concrete set into the grass, uh, washing airplanes, stacking the hangars, fueling the airplanes, uh, doing anything necessary, painting, cutting grass, whatever. And they paid me in flying time. And when I eventually left school, I, uh, I had an apprenticeship, which was pretty rare by then, because this was, uh, I guess, the, the 1970s, uh, in 1980s, and the apprenticeships in aviation really had pretty much ended. That was more of a, a wartime in 1950s purview. And they gave me an apprenticeship as a mechanic. And uh, for some reason, um, I, I got involved with, with uh, the royal family and Prince Michael of Kent came and learned to fly. And that was a time when the uh, 0240 engines on the Cessna 150 Aerobats we had as our primary training airplanes, um, had uh, starter clutches and they were like uh, latch pulls, uh, pulls, P A W L S, uh, that would grab the clutch. And when you engage the uh, solenoid, the starter, it would uh, turn the engine over and start the engine. Well, these darn things back then were wearing out and parts were not available. And so for a long time until you actually got replacement sprags, we called them, um, mm -hmm. you'd have to hand prop the airplane. And I hand propped Prince Michael Kent so many times for his flight lessons that he came into the hangar one day and said, Cox? And I said, yes, sir. He said, Cox, give me a screwdriver. And I ha happened to have this long screwdriver with a, um, a day glow orange handle. I still have it in my toolbox in the garage here. Um, and he said, kneel down. And I, and I handed him the screwdriver and I knelt down and he doffed me either side. He said, I now pronounce you the Royal Starter Motor. The so Royal Starter Motor. That, that is my fantastic. story. And, and funny enough, years later, uh, I was at Air Hansen uh, working on, uh, they had a, a Raytheon dealership and I was working on uh, beach jets and King Airs and, sometimes on the helicopters and uh, Sarah Ferguson actually Fergie came and learned to fly helicopters while I was there. So uh, I don't know. I've moved in a few Royal circles, I guess. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> but that's, you are the only that's person my I analogy. know who's ever been knighted with a screwdriver. <laughs> exactly. The Royal screw uh, starter motor. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, the whole point of this is to uh, is to talk about uh, some aviation history and uh, and a cocktail. And yeah. uh, I, 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 your introduction semi accurate. I'm not. I don't really drink that much, and I have to admit, <laughs> I I bought all the ingredients for this cocktail, and I picked this cocktail because of the historical significance, not particularly because I like the cocktail. It's okay. But I can take cocktails, take it or leave it. So don't care. But to me, this is iconic because Pan American Airways, they started uh, with a U.S. airmail contract uh, from Key West to Havana. And that all started, uh, founded by one trip. Uh, and their first flight was Friday, October 28th, 1927. And for most people, hopefully, that are watching this, listening to this, you have a concept of what Pan American Airways, or should I say Pan Am, yeah. turned into. Mm -hmm. um, and there's quite a bit of significance, to me anyway, in business aviation, because 
it was Pan Am business jets that actually brought the Dassault Falcon to the United States uh, with the help of Charles Lindbergh. So they really were probably, uh, to me, my favorite airlines in history have got to be Pan Am and Transworld Airlines. And unfortunately, both of them are dead. Uh, they, they both went bankrupt. Um, Pan Am started service, the very first service in history uh, uh, of their company, uh, Friday, October 28th, 1927. And their last flight, unfortunately, was from Barbados back to Miami to their, to, to their main base, really, because all of their activities have uh, centered around Miami. Um, but of course, they had a beautiful, beautiful terminal uh, at JFK, which was demolished several years ago. Oh, um, yeah. but, their, but their last flight was uh, December 4th, 1991, uh, with you a know. 747, and it was Clipper Goodwill. So I'm sorry, Paula. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think part of the reason that we remember um, Transworld and Pan Am so fondly is because they're not around today. They went, um, you know, they they expired, unfortunately, way before all of the airlines started having all of these problems. So, you know, when we think of travel when we were younger, it was so glamorous and it was so fabulous. And, you know, we have all those vintage posters and all of those memories from these airlines that haven't ruined their reputation by having to operate in these conditions, right? I completely agree with you. And and, and they were so, I, they, they were at the, the beginnings of the air transportation industry. I know that the, strangely enough, I, I, I live close to St. Louis and uh, the world's first airline service actually took place from Tampa to Clearwater uh, with a gentleman called, uh, I think it was Thomas Benoist or ben, Benoit. Benoit, uh, yeah. And he actually built uh, flying boats at yeah. Creve Core here in St. Louis, the suburb of St. Louis. And his airplane was the first uh, scheduled airline service ever in history. And it was a flying boat from Tampa to Clearwater. Mm -hmm. And it was an airplane designed and built here. Uh, which so so it's interesting and, it, and that, that kind of feeds in with the whole Pan Am thing because we're talking about flying boats here um, uh, mm -hmm. e even though their first flight was a uh, uh, it looks like a Fokker but I'm pretty sure it's not a, a, a Fokker uh, that they inaugurated the service with it wasn't it was a land plane it wasn't a, a flying boat but they became famous and they they reached out uh, to the world uh, with flying boats and uh, they very famously um, the Sikorsky city. So I, I just, I'm energized by the history of Juan Trip and his airline, uh, Pan Am. And so uh, when you talked about doing a uh, cocktail series, it, the first cocktail that came to mind is Yankee Clipper which is named after the flying boats, the main flying boats that uh, uh, Pan Am used. So um, basically uh, how it came about, the Yankee Clipper, uh, there was a gentleman called Charles H. Baker Jr. And he, he wrote articles for magazines and he wrote several books. And uh, he, was, he was referred to as a globe-trotting bon vivant. <laughs> and uh, he, he actually would hang out at Dinner Key, uh, Coconut, in fact, Coconut Grove, Florida. Um, Dinner Key uh, was where Pan Am had their uh, flying boat uh, base, and they would fly to the Bahamas. So uh, their first route was to H Havana, but their mainstay route after that for passengers, as well as mail, was... Uh, uh, the Bahamas and uh, good old Charles Baker Jr. would uh, would hang out because uh, he he had an apartment there, I believe, and he would hang out at a bar close to or or uh, adjoining on to Dinner Key, and he'd hang out with the pilots. And he actually published uh, in one of his books. 
uh, the recipe for the Yankee Clipper. And he says that uh, the recipe came uh, from the notebook of one of our pilot friends who, when off duty, may seek one. So basically, these guys would go fly uh, all across the Caribbean uh, and into the Atlantic. And when they were done for the day, they'd come back to uh, dinner key in Coconut Grove and uh, have a uh, Yankee Clipper made for them. And the Yankee Clipper uh, was pretty robust throughout the history of uh, Pan Am because uh, it was on their uh, in-flight menu pretty much from that point on. So um, I'm going to actually show you uh, a, um, a Yankee Clipper cocktail. So I have Fantastic. with me my, uh, my ice bucket. And inside my ice bucket, I have my coupe glass shilling. And the recipe calls for a coupe glass. This is my coupe glass, which is nicely chilled. I'm gonna take my cocktail shaker. I'm gonna put some ice in it. This is like the Tom Cruise section of the, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what was that movie that was cocktail? It was the movie. So, yeah. Oh, I don't that. know. All right. And in their uh, inimitable wisdom, whoever made these uh, shakers actually provides you with a cap, which is a one ounce serving. So the actual um, ingredients are apple brandy, one ounce of, so I am is that going the brand to... that you use, Mark, or did you use a different brand in yours? Just uh, to compare uh, and contrast since we're doing different two demos brand, of this. I believe. Yeah. So there's one ounce. It's, it calls for one and a half ounces. So there's my one and a half ounces in. Next, they call for a dash of absinthe. But the problem with absinthe is, uh, uh, I think it's wormold is a uh, is a plant that actually dyes uh, absinthe green, and um, there's there's a lot of stupid people out there, and uh, they say it's poisonous, so it, it gives you hallucinations. Well, I think if you take anything in excess, it's going to give you hallucinations. <laughs> right. But, uh, um, so trying to get absinthe is very difficult. So an alternative, you need a, 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 a pastis, which in this case I'm using Perno, which is a, a licorice uh, tasting uh, alcohol. It's French. It's very nice. I have a bottle here because when my brother comes over, he drinks the heck out of Perno. So I'm going to put a a dash, a, just a dash of uh, pastis in there. Next, it requires an ounce of lime juice. I have that, roses. I'm gonna put a, uh, an ounce of lime juice in here. And then the last ingredient of all is a uh, teaspoon of grenadine. So here's my grenadine. Also I'm roses. Gonna use, use my cap again. Cool. Just a teaspoon. So there's a little teaspoon in there, dropping it in. That's actually now really fun. clever. I didn't realize the cap was a one ounce jigger. In measure one ounce jigger exactly so you can measure your cocktail so put my cap on and then boom. <laughs> i'm not tossing it in the air or anything and Excellent. here we are here's my chilled coop That's actually a really pretty drink. Uh, I guess it's a green you, it makes it so beautiful. 
So ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. may I present to you a Pan Am inspired Yankee Clifford cocktail. And I wish you all health and wealth <laughs> for 2022. Good health. Fantastic. I'm drinking water, but I wish I had one of yours. <laughs> well, uh, I would make one for you, but uh, it's uh, it just doesn't work on Zoom, does it? Sorry. No, it doesn't. Right. I'm going to. This is nice. So that's it. That's my uh, my contribution to contrails and cocktails. This is a great story. That actually is really amazing. I, I love the, um, and I guess that's Art Deco is the, the period that right. a lot of those uh, Pan Am uh, posters and other um, art comes from. And, uh, you know, I mean, if I had my druthers and all the money in the world, I would do my whole house in this Art Deco sort of a style because I, I just <laughs> love that era. And I love the glamour of, of that time period and everything else. So that's really cool. And Polar, I love the drink. I can see you with a feather in your hair. I would wear a feather in my hat. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Outstanding. And maybe even a cigarette holder. There uh, you go. I have to learn how to smoke without. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. You can just smolder. <laughs> there you go. I can just sit there and smolder. <laughs> I never puff it. I just sit there and hold it. So that would be great. There you go. Right. So thank you for this opportunity, Mark. It's fun. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. For uh, Jeremy, I was wondering also if you could uh, just update us a little bit on what's going on currently in the, um, in the markets and <laughs> how it's affecting the appraisal numbers and <laughs> I'm glad we had a well, drink first before we talk about that. <laughs> when you're ready, when you're yeah, sold. No, no, no. It's, it, it's obviously uh, pretty much everything is trading uh, above what were the perceived market values from before. Uh, personally, I saw a shift twice last year in 2021 uh, that I saw that. Uh, up until April of 2021, uh, and, and, and I'm talking across the board now for uh, business and general aviation airplanes. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not even addressing warbirds uh, or, or rare vintage airplanes. I'm talking about specifically relatively modern. And when I say modern, we could be talking 50-year-old airplanes. I mean, I've seen some uh, Cessna 172s that, uh, from, the, from the 1950s, and they're trading at incredible values at the moment. But, uh, but anyway, I saw a shift in April of, of 2021 where we went from uh, discounted selling prices off asking price to asking price. So uh, most sales are transacting at asking price. And I gotta say, uh, there was a definite shift uh, in September of last year where we uh, went from asking price sales to premium sales. And uh, IADI, the International Aircraft Dealers Association, uh, for business jets and turbo crops, I am a member of that. And they published in uh, their quarterly report for 2021, which I actually use in, in my appraisal reports at the moment because they quantify exactly what I was seeing. But, and obviously, an appraisal is uh, an opinion, it's my opinion, but it's, it's laid out in a uh, credible way for uh, people to, to believe my opinion, but to have supporting data, published data that actually uh, mirrors the numbers that I have been seeing in my appraisals is, is a great uh, aid uh, and great supporting documentation to, be in, uh, to put into a, an appraisal report. And they reported third quarter 2021 that... Uh, uh, 
values or sales or transaction uh, between 20 and 30 and above percent above what people would consider to be a normal fair market value of an airplane. Yeah. And, and uh, really, it's um, as, as our, our good friend out in Colorado uh, has coined the phrase, it's the new normal. Uh, the, the fact is, um, it is, it is a new normal. So for, for any comps that I've been, uh, using in my appraisal reports sort of prior to September, then, uh, I'm, I'm adding, uh, a percentage above, uh, and for airplanes that uh, I know have traded above market value, I take their percentages and I put them into my appraisal reports. Everything is... Uh, trading high. Uh, everyone's getting premiums for their airplanes. And that's across the board. It could be uh, a Cessna 172. It could be a G650, uh, a BJ. It doesn't matter. So the state of the union at the moment, Mark, in answer to your question, is the market's on fire. And, yeah. and the biggest issue everyone is complaining to me that because uh, I do a lot of lot of appraisals for aircraft dealers and brokers, uh, even though I, you know, I, from my perspective, it's unethical for me to be involved in any, any aircraft transactions. So I make it that any dealer broker can come to me, ask me to uh, do an engagement for them, uh, an appraisal, and I won't talk about it. I'm not going to try and get in the middle of their deal. Yeah. And um, the biggest problem everyone tells me that's in the in the marketing and sales world is there's nothing to sell. Uh, there's just no inventory, and so it's it's tough times. It's boom times, but it's tough times. It's like feast and famine. Um, I'm gonna have another drink, and I'm gonna <laughs> toast to the market being on fire. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I've had to go back to the oil. Uh, the uh, I don't remember NAA, NAA days with the market specific condition uh, for some of my appraisals, you know, because the uh, they're just selling higher than market value. So I agree. I've been I've been using that tool as a form of of uh, as needed. I'm with you 100. percent I'm with you 100. percent I guess it's not a really good time to have something to sell, but not many people do, so or not something that they're willing to sell. Right, and that's and that's the problem. I mean, you, you, um, it's a good time to sell, but it's a terrible time to buy. And right. uh, I think a lot of people are hanging onto their airplanes. I mean, not just because of the pandemic and their unwillingness to travel on uh, public transportation on the airlines. Right. Um, uh, there, there, there's a lot of uh, reasoning um, behind the pandemic and the people's uh, selection of uh, business aviation. But, uh, but also, I, <laughs> I think people have realized through the pandemic that uh, instead of being driven, and, and working like absolute sloggers, uh, their, their life and their families uh, are much more important than their jobs. And so we're seeing a lot of personal air transportation. And so uh, those that have an airplane, uh, you may want to get bigger, better, faster, um, younger, all the different reasons for, for trading to a different airplane, but uh, the problem, you may get uh, a premium for your airplane, but you're also going to be a, paying a premium for the for the replacement airplane, but the, that's not the issue. The money's not the issue. The issue is, is there going to be an airplane out there to buy? And I, I, I talked to uh, a good friend of mine uh, that works for uh, Textron, and he told me yesterday that they are sold to the fall of 2023 with all of their new citation series airplanes they're just sold out period in the story so and and i think that's the case with most of the manufacturers so yeah it, it's it's the lack of airplanes that is the biggest problem 
It's not, it's not prices. It's not the money. There's plenty of money out there. The problem is availability. It's uh, uh, um, extreme demand versus a total lack of supply. So as I put in my appraisal reports, it's a uh, supply and demand situation. And I explain it and, and bolster it with the uh, IADA report that I include in my uh, appraisal reports. Yeah, that's great. Have it. And uh, yeah, who would have thought that this would have been a consequence of this pandemic? Um, you know, after 9-11, I thought the uh, corporate aviation would, this kind of thing would happen and it had the opposite effect. Everybody hid their aircraft for some reason. And, but uh, this was the other way around, so. I think and we're still hiding aircraft, though. I mean, they're still building shell corporations and other things. So, I mean, people are still hiding their aircraft, but they want them, uh, I think, bad enough to find a way to hide it, I guess, is well, one way of looking at it. When 9-11 hit, when I was at Bombardier, they shut down the assembly. They literally stopped making airplanes. Uh, I didn't then, know that. Uh, yeah, and then... Three months after 9-11, they completely restructured the company and downsized, and it uh, it never it never came back for me anyway. It was it was brutal, mm. but um, yeah. So this has been the opposite, right? So interesting. But oh, I did, I did want to met on the Pan Am thing. I did want to mention uh, I've got. Um, I picked up these, uh, the, remember the suitcase stickers that they used to give out? Sure. Yeah. I picked up some of those, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. I've got, uh, I've got a Pan Am suitcase sticker, TWA, American Airlines, and I think a Pratt and Whitney. I've got them in a, uh, nice. in a display case on my wall. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. I'll, I'll we'll send to... you a picture of it. We'll have to add a picture to the uh, to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wanted to tell Jeremy I have a Pan Am mm -hmm. suitcase sticker. <laughs> that's fabulous. very nice. Very nice. That's that's amazing. So uh, with all this continued chat, I'm just going to help myself to some straight apple brandy. I was just going to say... <laughs> You're amending your clipper. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's pretty nice. Mm. <laughs> no, uh, clipper's nice, but that's that's nice on its own. Mm -hmm. That Aramid, uh, I read the we read last night that they stopped making it during the war, World War II, I think it was. It didn't say why there was a shortage of something or other. And then the uh, the other the other brand is what became predominant after that. Right. Although I, I did you see, know, some. you know, if I wasn't so uh, set on uh, on the Yankee Clipper because of its historical significance, the other drink that is synonymous with Pan American Airways is the uh, Irish or Gaelic coffee. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they would fly, so they would leave from uh, Newfoundland at night, fly overnight, or the, the evening, they'd have dinner, they'd all bed down, and this is in the Sikorsky uh, flying boats, and they would land in Shannon uh, in, in Ireland, uh, mm. Western Ireland, and they would land shortly after daybreak, and so everyone would get off the airplane, uh, and you know, have a have a, a walk about, have a cigarette, and trying to trying to wake up. And on the cold mornings on the western western shores of uh, Ireland, uh, the um, the handlers there at the quay develop Irish coffee or Gaelic coffee. And what it is, it's it's coffee with Irish whiskey, and then you take. Uh, heavy cream, uh, what the Brits call, the Irish call, uh, uh, double cream, but it's heavy cream, and you would use the back of a spoon 
uh, inverted. So you'd use the back of the spoon and you'd pour your cream on top so it would float mm -hmm. on top of the, uh, the coffee that has the Irish uh, whiskey in it. And also they would put brown sugar in it. I forgot about the brown sugar. And that was their pick me up, wake me up breakfast drink while they're waiting for the uh, Sikorsky to get refueled so they could then take off again and land at their ultimate destination in, in the United Kingdom, which was uh, Southampton Water. And so, um, so their, their service was from uh, LaGuardia Airport to Southampton Water, and they maintained that all the way through World War II. And so wow. they may have stopped the Yankee Clipper on some of their, their 1940s wartime flights, but they were definitely providing their, their uh, passengers with the Gaelic or Irish coffee, one of the same. My mom calls it a Gaelic coffee. I call it an Irish coffee. That's hence. So, so I would have no, done that. That, that, was, that Irish coffee was like as old as the hills. I never realized that that was developed as a result of of the Pan American uh, Airways. Pan American you got, Airways. You got, two, you got two cocktails or two drinks that are what directly are attributable to them. What an airline. Yep. Heck of an airline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and it's a shame, shame they went bankrupt. But you know, I think Lockerbie didn't help them. Uh, Pan Am 103. Yeah. Uh, and uh, same with TWA. I mean, TWA 800 didn't help them either. No. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's just a shame to see such historical aviation greats just fade away into uh, oblivion. So, uh, with w that's why I wanted to talk about the uh, the Yankee Clipper. So, that's true. Good health. Oh, well, that's a fantastic story, and that's a fantastic drink, and you actually gave us two, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> we got a bonus for this one. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll have an Irish coffee. There you go. Oh. Yeah, we can always do another episode. <laughs> Absolutely. New England. Absolutely. Very popular in New England, the Irish coffee. Is it? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. I haven't spent much time in New England, and uh, so I don't even know what what's popular there and what's not. But uh, you'll have to enlighten us sometime, Mark. Yeah, I was looking up the um, the flying boat and uh, pretty amazing aircraft. Um, a thirty five hundred mile range, uh, massive dual cylinder radial engines. 300 gallons of oil, 200 knots, and then uh, 35 berths was amazing. You'll just look yeah. up that, that one yeah, seat. Sleeping accommodations, and, and I think they tried what uh, Zeppelin did. Uh, I think they, they had, they tried uh, an aluminum piano, or as, as I would say it when I grew up in England, an aluminum piano. But uh, it just it just took up too much space and uh, was too heavy, so they dispensed with it. But uh, the Zeppelins have pianos on them. Yeah, but the, you know, I, cry, uh, I get a kick out of the aluminum. Reminds me that uh, when I was adjusting uh, doors on Challengers, that that's a British design door on that aircraft, and to adjust the. Um, the door door uh, lock mechanism. The maintenance man says to use some plasticine. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Play doh. Uh, Play doh. I, we had no idea. We were all going, "What is plasticine?" <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out it's modeling clay. Yeah. <laughs> what the British yeah. call it, plasticine. <laughs> that sounds so much more. Um... Much better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you can handle being in an airplane that's been patched with plasticine, but being in an airplane that's plast plastered with modeling clay just sounds unsafe, you know, when it's the same well, stuff. You would put the plasticine, very, put the plasticine in, in there and then you would close the door and then reopen it and use that as your me adjustment measurement. Oh, okay. Uh, remind me uh, if we ever talk about Eastern Airlines, I, 
going to tell you about uh, my buddy who got hijacked to Cuba on the way to uh, his Eastern Airlines job interview. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he was all excited and was going to get hired, wanted to get into Eastern and had been doing everything he could to get into Eastern. And, and he, he, he was, uh, he literally got, it was in, uh, flown down from, I don't know, he was in Miami, I guess. And, uh, and uh, the airplane was hijacked and he missed his interview and never got hired. <laughs> and he'll never know if that was why he never got hired. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, he was not happy. <laughs> Although I, I, I was going to say the only claim claim to fame I have with association with Pan Am was uh, uh, I was at Marshalls of Cambridge uh, in the UK uh, before I came over here, and uh, I took a uh, an ex Pan Am uh, L ten eleven Lockheed L ten eleven, and was part of the crew that converted that to a Air Force air tanker, a, a Royal Air Force air tanker. And uh, um, it, it was sad. I mean, it was poignant. Uh, it was before Pan Am died, the death of bankruptcy, but uh, they were selling off some of their airplanes and the RAF were buying them. The British government were buying them. We were turning them into uh, air tankers. And um, I guess the weirdest thing was, I was working up on the wing doing flat actuators on this L-1011 for the, uh, an RAF tanker, a TriStar. And the guy, I was, I was on the night shift, and there was a guy working on the wing about 20 feet away from me, uh, uh, working on uh, uh, access covers. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, night supervisor came up with two policemen up onto the wing. And I thought, what the heck's going on? And they grabbed this guy by his... Uh, his uh, overall shoulder pads and hauled him off the airplane. I found out later that he'd been home uh, the weekend before and he'd hacked his wife to death with an axe. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh! I was, working, I was working on the wing of an, of an L-1011 TriStar, uh, working on slat actuators, and it was about uh, 1.30 in the morning, and, and I was working with an axe murderer. I had no idea. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. When I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I when was, I start drinking, I start telling you the real stories, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should drink at the beginning of the episode instead of the end and we'll get better stories. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and while I've been talking, all my hair fell out, you see? <laughs> 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 yeah, you were telling me you got a new. Uh, um, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, cool. I got a new hairdresser. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's called Pitbull Skull Shaver. That's what it's called. Very <laughs> anyway, those are my parting words. I love you and leave you guys. Okay. All right. Pan American Yankee Clipper B314 was produced by the Boeing Manufacturing Aircraft Company. <clears throat> from 1938 until 1939. 12 were made overall, and the aircraft was retired in 1948. The aircraft had four twin cylinder radial engines, 1600 horsepower, made by the Curtis Wright Corporation. There was a fuel load of 4,246 gallons, 300 US gallons of oil, just to operate the engines. Had a cruising speed of 199 miles per hour in a range of 3,500 miles. Carried 77 passengers with 36 overnight berths. This was built for one class luxury air travel. Five star cooks were hired from around the world and they carried two flight crews. The Clipper name refers to the call sign and also the white uniform caps of its pilots. And Donna is signaling me, let's make this baby. Okay, let's make it, Mark. Okay, Yankee Clipper was made with one and a half ounces of apple brandy of your choice.
one ounce of lime juice. One teaspoon of grenadine. And a dash of pastus or aramid if you can find it. And we have experimented with this drink and I preferred it with a little extra of the pastus. So once you've incorporated everything into the drink. Give it a good shake. Should I pour it in two glasses? Sure. Or all in one? Oh, pour that one into yeah, one yeah. glass and let's make another one. Get some there good practice go. here. Yankee Clipper. Thank you, one trip. Now you can pretend that you are your 314 Yankee Clipper to Hawaii. Okay, let's see you try it, Mark. Cheers. How is it? Wonderful.